Now, allow me to introduce our distinguished guest keynote speaker, Minister Tang Feng, Audrey Tang. <laughs> Audrey Tang is a Taiwanese freelance software programmer who has been described as one of the 10 great Taiwanese computing experts. By the year 2000, at the age of 19, Audrey has already held position in software companies and worked in California Silicon Valley as an entrepreneur. What an achievement. In August 2016, she was invited to join the Taiwan Executive Yen as a minister without portfolio. Audrey took office as a digital minister on October 1st and was placed in charge of helping government agency communicate policy goals and managing information published by the government via digital means. Audrey was quoted saying, the goal of my existence is not to become a minister for a certain group, nor to broadcast government propaganda in state. It is to become a channel to allow greater combination of intelligence and strength to come together. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome our Minister Tang to give us a Thank you. So, um, honored guests and faculty members and all the students here, I'm very, very happy to share with you um, as a channel. So, I promise no government propaganda in my 30 minute speech. <laughs> all right. Um, can we uh, get a projection uh, showing from my um, laptop? Let, let's just try this out. Um, is the projection showing for you? Yes, it is. So um, my talk, the 30 minutes talk, will be crowdsourced. Uh, by crowdsourcing, and it is one of our national directions, is that uh, we ask you to ask me questions. Uh, if you have anything that's capable of scanning a QR code uh, near the projector, there should be a QR code that is scannable. If it is too far away from you, you can uh, manually enter the website slido.com. That's slido.com. And once you're in the slido.com website, you can enter today's date. That is 615 without the pound sign. So either by scanning the QR code or by entering the code, you will enter into this anonymous chat room where you can ask me anything and everything. And so just two uh, rules. One is that you can like each other's questions, and the questions with the most number of likes will float to the top, uh, which I will start answering uh, first. And feel free just to add all your thoughts, your ideas, even the things that you want to talk to your fellow um, students, your classmates, your families, and so on, because this uh, space belongs to everybody. So uh, while you're um, no doubt scanning the QR code and joining the uh, Slido chat room, uh, let me first introduce a little bit of my office, uh, the Taiwan Public Digital Innovation Space uh, in the Central Administration. So um, this is my office. Um, it looks um, quite unlike any administration building. Um, and in fact, this office is designed by a hundred or so of social innovators around Taiwan. The designer of this soccer field, as you can see here, is actually from Kaohsiung. Uh, it's the Children RF's foundation, or the Carers Foundation. Locally, uh, the name is called Xi Han Er Zi Jin Hui. The people with Down syndrome, people with trisomy, uh, chromosomal differences actually enable them to view the world in a very different way. Whereas maybe we view the world through the abstractions of text and numbers, the people with Down syndrome view the world as geometric shapes and patterns. And that means that when they draw out the world that they exist in their mind, they actually create installations of public art that can inspire the best of us in a space of innovation. Through this way, social innovation introduced the idea of participation by everybody and for the benefit of everybody. So this, of course, is my office. So every Wednesday, I'm here in the Social Innovation Lab, and everybody can talk to me. Anyone can book 40 minutes of my time and just talk on whatever they feel like. Any innovative ideas that they want to introduce to the society, they can talk to me. The only condition being that it should be radically transparent, meaning the entire transcript needs to be put online for everybody to quote and to follow. 
radical transparency is going to be very useful to all of you uh, graduate students in the future. Through radical transparency, through publishing your portfolio and your work online, you will be able to discover people with similar ambitions, similar values, and similar goals. And once they discover each other, they can form collective intelligences that is much greater than individual parts. Just use one example before I turn back to your questions, assuming that you are starting now asking questions. Um, here are some self-driving vehicles. And these self-driving vehicles, unlike the popular image of cars or buses or trucks, these are actually tricycles. And the great thing about a self-driving tricycle, or they call themselves the persuasive electric vehicle, is that it's entirely open. Open is another thing, addition to radical transparency, that I adhere to. Open means that anyone can take this car, or rather tricycle, and change any part of it without fear of, you know, violating patents or copyrights. People can change the hardware, the software. The data it collects is entirely open. So the technology belongs to the society rather than the other way around. Everybody can just look at the self-driving tricycles and start to figure out ways to integrate them into their everyday life. For example, uh, the Social Innovation Lab is very close to a flower market called the Jianguo Flower Market. And so people who shop for orchid flowers, pots of flowers um, in the Jianguo Flower Market consider them very helpful because they're actually just like shopping carts that can follow you around intelligently. And once you buy some flowers, you can just put them into the cart and it will follow you. And once it's almost full, it can summon another one to follow itself for mere fleet. And by the time you're done shopping, you can just hop on one and it drives you home. And so again, this is a very creative use uh, of self-driving vehicles that cannot be anticipated by the original creators. And it led us to look at the parts that we don't like. For example, once it's stuck into the flower market, it cannot uh, signal its um, distress except by flashing this red light. So people don't like that. So nearby students in a hackathon just change it. So now those self-driving vehicles looks like something like this. They have two eyes, they can blink, these are LED eyes, they can make interesting uh, facial gestures, they can look at uh, people and actually have a conversation and hold uh, the eye gaze uh, with people. And so just this very simple example actually illustrates the point that once the technology is in the services of society and allow anybody to change or tinker it, people can form very interesting collaborations that went way beyond the original inspiration of the original inventor. So maybe if you're an inventor, just give out your invention. In participate in open innovation, allow people to build on your work so that you can see the seeds of your innovation be used in appropriate way around the world. So that's a very like short like five minute pitch and let's see if there are any questions. Oh, about my hair. This is great. Um, all right. So um, my hair is actually done. In the uh, Jian Cai, it's a, uh, a social enterprise uh, in Taipei City. Uh, and Hao Jian Cai, Cai is uh, the Cai for talent, is a social enterprise that specifically builds a hair salon for the benefit of immigration, of people who are new migrants, of people who are disadvantaged, of people who are excluded from their community. They hold regularly um, events where they invite people, the new immigrants, the uh, people who are integrating migrant workers into their society to receive free haircuts and perms and other hair treatments. And they don't have to pay except with their stories. And once they share their stories, uh, the people at Hao Jianzai collect those stories and into um, like pamphlets and other creative work for other people who are uh, doing their hair in this uh, shop to read. And so through this way, they basically serve as a communication channel for everybody in the community to discover the best of the new immigrations, of the migrant workers, of the um, diaspora community from other cultures, and to build a cultural bridge between different parts of Taiwan and different parts in their vicinity. And this kind of
of social entrepreneurship is actually very successful. I met many workers in the Haojian Cai that says they specifically look at the social purpose of this、uh, hair salon in order to join. Not only that they receive excellent training and that they work to toward a common purpose, but they can also participate in the idea that Taiwan is becoming a pluralistic、um, culture and that we respect each other's culture by way of getting people's time. Because when you're doing your hair, you really have nothing else to do, right? So you really have to go through other people's stories and go through the social work that、uh, this hair salon has done. So excellent questions, by the way,、uh, and、uh, it proves that no matter which trade you're in, you can work on a social purpose for sustainable development and contribute to the society in general. The, there's 18 people who would like to ask, how did I achieve the main today? So as I said, I am a channel. The channel means that everybody's collective intelligence channels through me, and I make sure that people's e-petitions, people's sandbox experiences, everything that you want the government to change can channel through me to effect change. I'll just use one very quick example.、Um, we have this idea of a regulatory sandbox. And this is an interesting、uh, experiment, by the way. If you have anything that is a new invention, maybe self-driving vehicle, maybe fintech, there's many different majors here that you find that our existing regulations are blocking you from happening. You can check this index and see how many people have challenged this regulation before. And before we have the sandbox system, it's an either or black or white thing of whether a new innovation is legal or not. But now, after introducing the sandbox system, you can see all. Almost a hundred cases where people just say, "Oh, let's try our version of the regulation for a year and see whether it's a good idea or not." And if it's a good idea, then it becomes the national regulation. If it's not a good idea, well, no harm done. We thank the investors for the tuitions、uh, paid for everybody, and everybody learns from it and try some other way. And so it is not my. Kind of personal invention, but rather I create the space for experiments and inventions in platform economy, in financial technology, in self-driving vehicles, and make sure that I meet with people to co-create the regulation that is required for their particular vicinity. Now I know some of you you、uh, have participated in USR or universities、um, social responsibility programs、uh, serving the indigenous people or people who are otherwise disadvantaged. I personally tour Taiwan. Every Every other Tuesday or so, to meet with people in such social circumstances, and I bring with me the 12 different ministries virtually, so we connect. The rural and indigenous places with Taipei City, Kaohsiung City, Taichung City, Taoyuan City, and so on, so that everybody can look at a local problem from the context of the locality in a way that is actually maximizing the interpersonal conversation. So, me serving as a local facilitator, maybe in Huali and maybe in the Pas Cordura Islands and so on, but always bring with myself 12 different ministries with me and virtually, and they have to talk. Quickly among themselves to brainstorm a solution for regional revitalization. So the way to make something that you want to achieve is sometimes much easier if you can just declare that you want to be a channel that connect the、um, different forces together. In terms of the sustainable development goals, that is the 17th United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, that is partnership for the goals. Once you say, "Oh, I want to、uh, build partnerships between the economic, social, environmental sectors," suddenly people who identify with any particular goals will build an affinity toward you, so that you can look for the synergies between the different projects. And so, to answer the question more、um, directly, I built my、uh, portfolio basically by ensuring that people have reliable. Data that can share with each other by ensuring the partnership are effective because people can trust each other's data and numbers through distributed ledgers, such as the blockchain and other technologies. And I make sure that all the innovations, all the inventions, as a result of this work, is released under open license, meaning that people wouldn't get sued、uh, for violating patent or copyright based on sharing their innovations and inventions. And so this is like a quick、um, answer、uh, to this question. But basically, I do this. By take designing myself out to make everything not rely on my judgment, but rather relying on a mechanism of co-creation.、Um, so, 24 people would like to know. May I ask, what is innovation to you? How would you apply it in the business or even in daily life? 
Plus, may I book 40 minutes of session with you? So that's actually two questions. But the second question is very easy to answer. You can just go to my website, which is au, that's my initial, dot pedis, that's my um, office, uh, public digital innovation space. So au dot pdis dot tw. And you can very quickly see, because this is an English speech, I'll switch to English interface. You can really quickly see uh, my schedule. So. Seems that I have um, time in September. So in any case, you can very easily just go to this system and book my um, time and also look at who other people are looking at uh, booking my time and also learn from them through our public transcripts. All those transcripts are published in the so-called Say It system um, in our website. So you can see that after becoming the digital minister, I have talked with 4,000 people in about you know 200,000 speeches and all the sections. And you can go through each and every one of them if you have too much time. But please make full uh, use of the full text search so you can look at any idea and type a search into it. And you can look at how the interactions has been for other people who have booked 40 minutes of my time. Now. Um, um, the, the main question, what is innovation to me? To me, innovation is a new idea that has the potential to scale. And scale has very different meanings to very different people, so I need to uh, quantify this. Basically, there are three different ways to scale an idea. You can scale it up, meaning that you can build the, your innovation so that more people are using it and that um, it can win uh, more um, affinity of people who think like you and then use it to change the society by kind of playing a tug of war uh, against the old regime and the old system. So you can scale up or you can scale it out. You can put out an innovation and invite everybody to use it, like the internet or the world web or the blockchain. It can be used for social purpose, for business purpose, for environmental purpose, for governance for purpose. So you can scale it out. Or you can build partnership and scale it deeply. And scaling it deeply takes a very different view of scaling innovation. I will use one very quick example. It's called the presidential hackathon. Uh, because it's presidential hackathon, right, I have to show the president. <laughs> uh, Dr. Tsai, she said, democracy was sought as a fight between two opposing values. But now, actually, democracy is not just voting. It could become a conversation between diverse values. So the story, not just of self-driving vehicles, but also of presidential hackathon, is about scaling deeply. Last year, we chose five teams out of a hundred or so of teams. One of the teams are the water saviors, because they save water, you see. Um, what they are is the Taiwan Water Corporation maintains the world's longest uh, pipes of water supply. And the plastic pipes, they leak sometimes, so it requires special um, skills staff to listen to those pipes to see whether they leak. Mostly they didn't, right? But once they uh, leak, it takes around seven months for them to discover. But because of open innovation, they can share the data of their flow, of their pressure, of the, the pipe system, and actually partner with the young students, graduate students actually, to build a chatbot on the line system so that these repairs people can wake up and chat to their virtual apprentice. And the virtual apprentice would say, oh, the most likely leaking point near you are those three points, and please listen to those first. And it drastically saved their time so that it's now only take one-tenth of the time to detect water leak. But the great thing about presidential hackathon is that it is also indexed using the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So we just broadcast to the world that we have a solution to tar target 6.4, which is increasing water use efficiency. And then New Zealand, because they didn't have a shortage problem of water, but now because of climate change, they're beginning to. So they just say, oh, this is excellent. Let's invite the winning team from the presidential hackathon to Wellington. And then they work for another three months. And so this co-creation is very interesting because if you trust another country very well, that is the basis of handing out your water pressure, your water flow, or your public water and sanitation data to the co-creation team from Taiwan. So the more you collaborate, the more trust is built, both internationally and also across sectors. And so scaling deeply, that is to say, to find some shared value despite different positions, to create something of value, but also allow other people to extend it. This is the kind of scaling of innovation that I'm referring to. 
And the most important thing of building those data collaboratives is that all the winning teams, all the five winning teams every year in our presidential hackathon are trilingual. So domain experts, technological experts, and also public servants, they form a team together. And the winning team gets a trophy from the president. There's no money, there's a trophy. But a trophy is very special, and you may want to apply that to your future works. What a trophy is, is a projector. If you turn on the projector, it projects the image of the president handing the trophy to you. And so it's very useful in internal negotiations. If your director general doesn't like your idea, you can just turn on the projector and show the president. Here in Taiwan, we call it a shen zhu pai. You can summon uh, the president very quickly uh, to your internal negotiations, and it signifies the presidential promise that whatever you have delivered in the three months of experiment, we are committed ourselves to do whatever it takes to bring your idea into the public service after a year. And so this kind of promise taken on the presidential level to the collective intelligence enables a wide swath of innovations all around Taiwan, and this is this year's cohort. So uh, 20 people would like to know, any suggestions for this new generation to succeed in such a comparative global work market? Um, this is very interesting because they use the word comparative instead of competitive. I like this uh, typo or not. It, it may be intentional. Um, it, it really is true that it's both competitive but also collaborative. So comparative is actually a really good word. Uh, but the, the idea here, very simply put, is that through the internet, through the open innovation system, it is no longer the case that you have to do everything yourself. Chances are in the open innovation system, there are already something that is 90% uh, already towards solving whatever problem that you're solving, and there's a community already there. Um, with you know half the world's population connected on the internet, even if the focus of your problem of your issue is only you know a tiny fraction of the population, you can still find a community online. So my first suggestion is just to find your online community using again the sustainable development goals, but also hashtags and popular trends, and making sure that you can work toward what people are already collectively working on. That is the key to success by essentially doing nothing and joining a rising community and enjoying the collective uh, creation. Before we have Wikipedia, before we have co-created um, entire operating systems like Linux, Android, and um, for example, the Firefox browser and everything like that, people thought it's not possible for hundreds of thousands of people to work co collectively together in an efficient manner. Uh, without any hierarchical organization. But now the internet generation, as many of you are, proved that this is not only possible, but also fun. So making your message actionable, that is to say anybody can just participate in your course uh, with a few seconds of participation. It may be an e-petition. It may be, I don't know, now that you're graduated, I can talk about Friday strikes, right? Um, a, a bunch of people in Europe have started the idea of just not going to school every Friday, and in, but actually learning about climate change on the street. So anything that people can easily act on, and anything that is connected, meaning that when people join this kind of movement, they will be very willing to share it, like the ice bucket challenge, where people put some ice water on themselves, videotape it, and push public it on the internet, it will be very uh, not fun if you don't share it. It will be pointless. But because people share it, it raises a new awareness on uh, people with uh, different kind of uh, physical situations as we are. So actionable and connected. And finally, make it extensible, making it that nobody controls the use of such memes, that everybody can make an extension of those memes and tackle the way in a very different uh, solution and make sure to share such solutions. And this is basically the entire idea of open innovation. And if you embrace open innovation, there is no failure because once you do something and find out it doesn't work, everybody benefits. As I said, as in a sandbox, if it doesn't work, it's like paying the tuition of everybody else who wants to participate in this innovation. And through this way, everybody benefits, and you will be encouraged, actually, to quote-unquote fail 
for a dozen or so of times because it's contributing to the swarm-like intelligence to find creative solutions to our most pressing problems, including climate change and things like that. And so I think that is the greatest way because once you join this kind of open innovation system, there is no failure at all. Everything, every step that you try is to the benefit of the entire collective intelligence. So I have maybe um, 20 minutes. Let's take a few questions more. What inspiring message do I give to the graduates today for innovation applicability in your future career? Um, I would uh, quote maybe a prayer uh, that I uh, wrote myself two and a half years ago when I became the digital minister. You see, this position is new, so there's no digital ministers before in Taiwan, in the central government. So I have to write my own job description. And when the HR department asked me to write a job description, I really want to convey the message that digital is not just about technology. It's not about information technology or IT or communication technology or ICT. It is actually about making sure that we can learn from each other in an open way. So I just write my job description as a poem when I was in New Zealand. And so, because you're, you asked for inspiration, so I'm going to read it to you in an inspired way, I guess. All right, so it goes like this. This is my job description. This describes the position of digital minister. When we see the internet of things, let's make it an internet of beings. When we see virtual reality, let's make it a shared reality. When we see machine learning, let's make it collaborative learning. When we see user experience, let's make it about human experience. And whenever we hear that a singularity may be near, let us always remember that the plurality is here. Wow, thank you. So I see 25 questions. Um, there's no way that I can go through all of them. So sorry for the people who didn't lobby hard enough for other people to vote um, at your questions. Um, so um, there's uh, quite a few people who are interested in learning what inspired uh, May to personally join the free software movement and later open culture movement and other movements um, around the internet. So I joined the movement when I was 15 years old. That was 1996. Um, and I discovered that the future of human knowledge is being created on this new thing called the World Wide Web. Um, the most inspiring website that I have found at the time, and still, it's still around. Some of you may have uh, still use it. It's called Archive, A-R-X-I-V, so Archive with an X. Um, and there's many other branches of archive now. There's the social archive, there's other open publication, but this is the original one from the Cornell University. Um, and so archive is like a bulletin board system. Some of you may have a D-card account, right? Some of you may have a PTT account. So this is actually a lot like a forum, just like PTT or Reddit um, or uh, D-card, but all the different boards are actually branches of science. And so in each of the science uh, branches, for example, computation and language, which is my uh, main domain, um, you can see actually new posts. But each post is a paper, and that paper has not been published. It is what we call preprint, before peer review or during peer review. People voluntarily donate their draft of their papers here for other people to connect and for other people to comment on. And so when I stumbled through um, the archive network uh, in the 1996, I discovered that my textbooks were all out of date. Compared to those preprints here, I feel like I lived 10 years in the past. And this is the future. The future is being created here because for emerging technology or emerging um, idea to be adopted by the mainstream community, then for the textbooks to start writing about it, it takes around 10 years. So then I talked to my principal of my junior high school. Um, so Du uh, Huiping, that is the name of my junior high school. Uh, so the principal said, so why do you want to talk to me? And I said, uh, principal, 
you told me that I have to study to get into a good university to uh, maybe pass GRE or some other um, lang language exams and to go to a great lab uh, overseas to start working on computational linguistics, cognitive science, and artificial intelligence. But I just discovered this great website and I just emailed the author saying that I want to contribute and I find some issues with their papers. And the professors start writing back to me because they don't know that I'm just 15 years old, right? So they just treat me as another scholar and we just started co-creating uh, co projects and even publishing together. And so I'm like, I found this shortcut. I don't have to, you know, study anymore. So this is a graduation ceremony, so I can talk about this because you're already graduated anyway, right? So basically my, my own message uh, for you, if there's one thing to remember, is that there is a academic community that everybody can join. It is in the open access community, it's in the archive community. And I owe all my thanks, all my gratitude to my principal at the time, who after hearing my case say, tomorrow on, you don't have to go to the school anymore because you have found a larger university. And the larger university is the internet itself and the open innovation system. So now maybe today you leave this physical university, but welcome to the larger university that is the humankind's collective innovation system on the wider internet. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister Tom, for the address and blessings given to our graduate. Please be seated. 谢谢唐凤政委员。